Well, welcome everybody. I think we'll get started. <clears throat> Thank you for taking time out and joining us for the 23rd annual ODR Cyber Week. Um, and <clears throat> I'm Leah Wing. I'm the co-director of the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution. And we have on the call, you can see Ethan Katch, who's the director and he's the father, the innovator who developed ODR. Um, welcome to all of you. I'm just going to set the context for this final panel. Um, and not final panel, there are more things this afternoon in Cyber Week, but the final panel in discussing um, this wonderful book that has just come out. So please um, bear with me while I share my slides. <clears throat> We're celebrating the new edition of Online Dispute Resolution Theory and Practice, a treatise on technology and dispute resolution. Um, updated chapters from the previous edition and a whole set of brand new chapters to look at the present and the future of ODR. And this panel is um, uh, well populated by experts from all over the globe. We're looking forward to hearing from them. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of the book, um, I will put this information in the chat and you are welcome to get a 40% discount if you use the URL at the bottom. And as you could see, we've had a rich set of discussions with all the authors and the um, editors. Um, and if you're interested in looking at previous versions of, or previous panels, feel free to go to odr.info and look up um, the webinar archive, and um, you'll be able to hear the other presentations. And with that, I hand it off to Colin Rule, who's going to moderate. Thank you so much, Leah. And before I get going with the panel, I just want to take a moment to say thank you, Leah. You were the visionary behind this whole week and everything that's happened. It's been an incredible cyber week, and it, you just you put in yeoman's work to make this happen. So I just a round of applause for Leah for all of her wonderful, wonderful work this week. Thank you. I, I have to thank you very much. I appreciate it. But I have to say I was part of a team and it was absolutely a team effort. Colin um, here and Dan Rainey and Noam Ebner have been incredible and wonderful to work with. So um, thank you. Well, my one regret is that we can't take uh, Leah out and, and uh, get her a nice glass of wine and buy her dinner to thank her for everything. But we'll, ha we'll have to do that in Dublin. Uh, please, Colin, Bill, what were we going to say? Is it yo woman's or yo? That's a good point. That's a good point. Here it is. We've got a, what is it that Foucault said? Language shapes the way we think about things. You've you've done a yo woman's effort. effort. That doesn't come off the tongue as, as smoothly. Yo woman. Yo woman. So. <laughs> yo, All yo. right. <laughs> yes. Yo, y'all. Exactly. All right. Well, let's get into this wonderful panel today with many of my best friends. I know this is going to be uh, just total rock star and we don't have that much time. So let's begin with uh, Jan and Amy. Please kick us off. All right. Uh, good day to all of you. Uh, I'm Jan Martinez. I'm director of the Gould Center for Conflict Resolution at Stanford Law School. And I want to thank uh, Leah and Ethan, Dan, Colin, and my fellow panelists who are um, who are summarizing in five minutes or less our contributions to this uh, fine book. Um, so Amy and I are really delighted to uh, share the highlights of our chapter. Uh, but uh, there's a benefit that we're coming after all these other panels that a lot of the highlights uh, of the field have really been touched on already. Uh, so we're going to pick a couple uh, sub subsets. Um, Clay Christensen is known for describing innovation as a, disru a disruptive force. And I'm su we're suggesting that you flip it. Uh, here, disruption has led to innovation. Uh, the disruption in our society, in the pandemic, in the economics and the technological forces that have been flowing for the last few years. So we really have seen amazing innovation in ODR. Uh, we, uh, so many of you may have attended uh, my book talk uh, at NCTDR on dispute system design. And from that, Amy and I were building uh, in our chapter various aspects of uh, that we thought were relevant and how ODR plays that role. 
Uh, the framework that I normally uh, focus on is goals. What are the goals of the system? What are the processes that are available now, including ODR? Uh, what are the, the resources that are available to design the system and implement it? Uh, what is the culture, the context? Our context is one of disruption. Uh, and evaluation, how do we assess the extent to which a process is effective in serving the purposes? So I think is with the goals uh, as basic as efficiency, and I think online has offered uh, the efficiency in time, in resources, in people, uh, human resources and financial resources, both. Uh, voice, the importance of uh, being able to express one's experience or one's concerns. Uh, the notion of justice, which may be the premier goal for most dispute resolution systems. Are we achieving justice, either procedural or uh, substantive? Access to justice, however that justice is defined, uh, can uh, our processes that draw on ODR actually enhance the capacity to, to seek justice? Preserving relationships, uh, flexibility in either preventing more conflict, in managing it once it emerges, and resolving it if it needs to go into more formal processes. So I think what we have seen in the United States is a whole array of ODR uh, applications, which many of which have been featured in the conference this week. So the piece I wanted to emphasize is drawing on Leah's work in NCTDR in thinking about how do we think about the third party and the fourth party in tandem. And so not one or the other, uh, but combined and intertwined in different ways. So thinking of a spectrum of human intervention and a, a spectrum of technological intervention. You might have all human and no tech, or you might have all tech at some point. It's all the fourth party with no human uh, and all kinds of combinations in between. So therefore ODR really is, um, is shifting in its shape, in its application, in its inputs, in its outputs uh, in a really, uh, transient way uh, day to day. So I want to turn over to uh, Amy, my co-author, uh, who's really going to focus on the specific underpinnings of ODR in the AI realm. Amy. Hi, thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you. And thank you again to Leah and to the entire gang and everyone with uh, Cyber Week. And also thank you to my co-author, Jan Martinez, couldn't be more delighted to working with her it was just plain fun. Um, I would do it every day um, if I could, because <laughs> it was wonderful. And what we did in terms of thinking about fitting not only the forum to the fuss, but fitting the tech to the fuss and building on system design and really thinking about how technology can be used for problem solving from kind of conflict prevention and resolution. We also did sort of a deep dive in looking at what currently exists. Right, because if we do want to think about the spectrum and think about how technology might assist, right, so the third and the fourth party could be working together um, in different ways, it's really helpful to look at what does exist and what doesn't exist and needs to exist. And one of the things we did in the course of our research is we went through and we built on the list of ODR providers that was already um, on NCTDR. And these were all self reported legal tech tech companies that said they were ODR providers. Now we did um, not have an opportunity to try out every single provider and find out who's doing what for sure, but we did our best to dig deeply into looking at what is out there. And we did sort of eliminate some that were on the list and didn't appear to provide ODR at all. We also um, added some that we know are out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in our chapter, we talk about we we came to a list of 70 and we wanted to look at, you know, what things are they really providing? Are they using AI or not really? And what we did find, I think, is significant because what it showed us is a move toward innovation, but significant gaps where we need more innovation, especially if we truly want technology that can fit 
the tech to the bus and be most helpful for problem solving. And in our analysis, what we found is by far and away, you generally have a lot of case management systems um, for the most part. Um, that was really sort of the most prevalent. We also see quite a few that provide online mediation. Um, and then followed by, of course, different forms of ODR, but with negotiation and arbitration, but less on the predictive analysis, less on the AI, less on different software that might in fact and should be built into modular systems for ODR as we sort of innovate into the future. And building on this work, and I do invite you to please look at our appendix um, we have Appendix A that summarizes what we found. And then also there is a more particularized appendix that is posted on SSRN, again, building on NCTDR's work and on their list of ODR providers. Now, at the same time, I've been working, kind of expanding on our work together in looking more deeply at this question of AI and data analytics and who's really using AI and data analytics. What kind of innovation are we seeing in the United States and elsewhere? And I did really focus mainly on the US and I included some of um, Australia and Canada because I was working with a partner from Australia, but we did kind of a further dive. And then we ended up eliminating um, different providers that really didn't provide ODR. And then we added um, agreement technologies and we added significantly other um, technologies out there. But our list and um, what we found again it showed the same sort of analysis in 2021. So why does that matter? Jan la laid out the importance, the importance of system design. She laid out the importance of problem solving, the importance of thinking of goals, thinking about functionalities, thinking about how we can best harness technology to expand access to justice. Well, sadly, you know, even given COVID, you would have thought that there'd be more advances in use of data analytics and AI to advance access to justice, but in fact, um, not so much, right? What happened, I think, to a large extent, and I think we all can acknowledge this, is people thought, oh, Zoom, that's ODR, right? I can jump on Zoom and do a Zoom mediation. But there wasn't so much in sort of the expansion of really thinking more deeply about actually using AI in these different ODR systems. Now, does it exist? Yes. Is it building? Yes. Do I see momentum? Absolutely. And in those areas, for example, advisory tools, decision management, different tools and technology that help with discovering your botna and working out problem solving at deeper levels. I will report that from the 64 that we had in the additional 2020 chart, 2021 chart, um, I did see more, more in the way of um, decision support tools, more in the way of advisory tools. So we are seeing sort of growth and I encourage more of this growth and discussion about how we can harness technology for access to justice. In my final moments though, I do want to, to warn, um, we have to think about ethical use of data, ethical use of data in our innovation as we move forward. All too often, legal tech is driven simply by angel investors and by funders. I subscribe to um, a newsletter from the Legal Tech Fund. In fact, I just got the newest one five minutes ago, and it talks about billions and billions of dollars going into these companies. A lot of them, most of them using AI, using data analytics, many of which are not dispute resolution providers, but it fits into dispute resolution plans. Many are not lawyers, they're just technologists, which there's nothing wrong with that. We should all work together. But it's important in dispute system design, it's important that everyone is at the table and everyone works together as we innovate and we move forward in an ethical manner. Um, so thank you very much. That to me is truly important as we try to reimagine access to justice using ODR in a world that's moving very, very quickly in the way of technology. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jan and Amy. Uh, I think what we've decided is because we have so many presentations, we're just going to go from presentation to presentation and then open everything up for Q&A at the end. But if anyone has any uh, clarifying questions or anything for the presenters, please put it in the chat and then we can address it. But let's move on to our next uh, esteemed presenter. Nicolas, please take the floor. Thank you, sir. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> So hopefully you see my screen right now. And uh, I obviously in our chapter, uh, Kareem, who unfortunately couldn't be with us uh, uh, today, he already had a, another uh, 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 another meeting. Um, we took a, a more of a historical approach on how uh, ODR evolved in Canada and, and where it uh, 
it's now going and and how it developed over the years and so we basically started with the work uh, that uh, and i saw ethan online uh, on the the call that ethan and, and kareem did uh, back uh, in the uh, mid 90s which led to the creation in 1996 of the cyber tribunal which was launched in 98 which was as far as we know the first uh, uh, odr platform in canada that that operated with the classic ODR model of negotiation, mediation, and, and arbitration should the first two levels fail. Um, and uh, one of the first, in fact, uh, in the world. And that led to, uh, a, a year later, uh, the privatization, actually, of the Cyber Tribunal, which became eResolution, which was a, a, an ODR uh, platform and company uh, that settled a, a great number of uh, domain name disputes back in the day. Um, E-resolution uh, stayed in, uh, in force for about three years, and then for different reasons, they decided to uh, close their doors, but not before uh, being uh, contacted by the European Commission to develop what would become ECOZEA, the Electronic Consumer Dispute Resolution Platform. Uh, that was uh, one of the influences in the development and the adoption of the ODR regulation in Europe. And so that was really the, the, the first uh, uh, stages and uh, all of that uh, happened in Montreal. And I always like to remind uh, Karim that I, I'm way too young to remember this firsthand. Um, I wish that was true. Uh, but uh, so that happened uh, obviously before uh, I jo joined the, uh, the ODR community, if you will. And over the following years, there were a lot of uh, obviously other uh, projects that emerged. Why? Well, because Canada is a particularly fertile ground for ODR for two reasons uh, that are obviously linked. The first one is our population. You have a relatively uh, small population, right, to 38 million people more or less, which is, if I'm not mistaken, is, is less than the state of New York. Um, but uh, um, at the same time, we also have one of the uh, biggest areas of land in the world with the second biggest country, depending on how you count. Uh, and obviously, so that population is, uh, there are pockets of population everywhere in this a huge area of land. Of course, most of us live close to the US border. Uh, I'd like to say it's because we like our US neighbors, but let's be honest, it's because of the weather. Uh, but um, mostly, again, most of us live within 100 uh, miles or kilometer or 150 kilometers or so from the US border. But of course, there are pockets of population uh, everywhere in the territory, and not necessarily courts or even uh, arbitration centers or mediation centers that uh, service uh, this great area. So ODR was the perfect answer to this. And that uh, led to a certain number of platform developers over the years uh, uh, who created very interesting uh, uh, solutions. Uh, one of the first, uh, of course, was Smart Settle, which I know uh, 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 Graham has worked with, and I believe uh, uh, that he still works with in, uh, in Europe and helped them implement the solutions in the UK. And they were really at the forefront of the blind bidding uh, uh, system in ODR and are still uh, probably uh, uh, one of the world leaders in that field. And then, of course, at the other end, there's uh, the work that my team and I have been doing at the Cyber Justice Laboratory, where we've de been developing our Parlay platform, or platform to aid in the resolution of litigation electronically. And that platform is today being used uh, uh, by uh, different bodies, both in Canada and in Europe. And there's a relatively newcomer uh, that I actually met at one of these meetings a few years ago, uh, and I still to this name uh, to this day have trouble pronouncing the name. I, I believe it's pronounced Sizda, but I'm not sure. Um, so an Ontario company that has been uh, uh, doing some really interesting work uh, developing platforms, most notably uh, in the area of family disputes. So there have been a, a couple of really uh, important players as far as platform developers. As for platform operators, uh, we've seen, again, a great number of uh, uh, players over the years. Uh, there was Nova Forum and Equibly in Ontario, and here in Quebec, we had Bid Settle uh, and Justicity, which just, which just launched uh, a little under a year ago. Uh, unfortunately, most of these did not succeed. Uh, uh, 
Nova Forum and Equibly unfortunately perished uh, in the sense that they, they shut down uh, after a couple of years. Nova Forum, technically their website is still on, but I don't think it was updated since the uh, early 2000s. Uh, and companies like uh, Bid Settle went into the, uh, the route of square trade where they basically just changed their business model completely to a point where they no longer uh, offer uh, ODR solutions. So again, Justicity, which was launched a little over a year ago as far as uh, private platform operators is one of the only ones uh, uh, in Canada, like Canada uh, uh, specific platform. And of course, in the paper, we look at the causes for that and, and why ODR has not succeeded in Canada as much as it could have and should have. And of course, these causes are ones that most of the people on this call are, are very familiar with. So I won't go into too many uh, details for them. The first one being lack of enforcement mechanisms, which is a, a, a problem that we've all faced. Uh, and the other one is the, the, the lack of a viable business model in Canada. I take bid settle for example, where they uh, try to implement a, a, a blind bidding system similar to that of, uh, um, uh, uh, of uh, our colleagues on the, the West Coast. And uh, they took a percentage of the settlement. And what people did is that they would make their first or second counter offers. And when they felt that they were going to get relatively close, they would just pick up the phone and talk to one another so that they wouldn't have to actually give any money to the platform. And that was basically its downfall. However, uh, uh, when you look at how ODR has evolved in Canada, and it's the same thing I know in the US and many jurisdictions, it, it's really uh, uh, public platform operators. It's the incorporation of ODR into uh, tribunals, or I should say rather the creation of ODR tribunals. And of course, most of you are very familiar with the uh, British Columbia Civil Resolution Tribunal, but we forget that that tribunal did not exist before 2013, and it was actually created as an OD a public ODR offering. It was never uh, seen as a classic tribunal. And same thing can be said for the Ontario uh, uh, Condominium Authority Tribunal, which again was created by law to be an ODR provider, an ODR tribunal. Uh, in Canada, in Canada, I'm sorry, in Quebec, we've had uh, uh, two uh, uh, developments of platforms, one being the Consumer Protection Agency, which never actually offered these types of services before and was not really a tribunal beforehand, but de facto became one uh, offering this platform. The only one, uh, the only solution in Canada that a, a an existing tribunal became an ODR provider was the CINEST, uh, which is uh, basically our uh, workers' compensation uh, a bureau here in Quebec. And oddly enough, the one that had the most resistance because there were established practices. And so the move towards ODR uh, by mediators uh, mostly was seen as something that uh, was not necessarily warranted or uh, necessary. And another thing that we look at in the paper, and I'll close on, on, on that thought, is that obviously uh, uh, since the uh, creation of ODR and since the launch of the very first platform, we've always talked about it as a solution for high volume, low uh, value disputes. Um, but what we're realizing more and more in Canada is that that's just simply no longer the case. Uh, as I mentioned, we're using it for labor disputes now, for co-ownership disputes, for uh, travel disputes, for uh, uh, even for family disputes, the, the ODR platforms. That was great. That was a wonder, wonderful overview. Thank you. And um, I think I will hand it next to our good friend who you, you cited in your presentation, Graham Ross. So Graham, the floor is yours. Oh, you're on mute. Will oh, you say it? I've done it now. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Colin. Th and thank you, everybody. Um, oh, thank you, by the way, should to Marta, Marta Popper, my co-author of the chapter. Uh, Marta's in Australia. It's, I think, 4.30 or something now. I, I said, really, there's no need for you to get up in there, share a 10 minute with me on that. Uh, I apologize in advance if you get a lot of banging and noises, not from Aldo, that's nothing to do with me, but I just heard some fireworks going off behind me. It's bonfire night tonight. Um, so uh, there's not much I can do about that. Now, what I want to do, uh, I thought, because there's no time to go through the things that we 
talk about in the chapter, except I want to just deal with um, not private initiatives, but organizational and governmental based initiatives on ODR in Europe on the basis that these may have lessons or, or value of interest to everybody else elsewhere in the world. Um, and I'm going to cover four such initiatives. Um, let me start with the Council of Europe resolution in 2019. So the Council of Europe, not to be confused with the European Union, um, this was set up in, me, in the aftermath of World War II to help avoid conflict in Europe and, and uh, underpin human rights. It, it developed the European Convention of Human Rights, which is responsible for enforcement. It comprises of 47 states in Europe, uh, much larger than the EU. And it, a couple of years ago, uh, three years ago, it decided to look into the question of whether ODR amounted to a threat to access to justice. Um, and they held uh, some meetings in Madrid. They invited myself and two other uh, experts to give evidence on where ODR was and what its impact in its various forms. And then they considered it. I'm pleased to say that in, I think it was 2019, they decided unanimously on a resolution. And I would recommend uh, reading it. It's because it, for reason, two reasons. First of all, it came to the view that it certainly ODR is not a, a threat to access to justice, quite the opposite. It's encouraging, increasing access to justice, and it's a good thing, and therefore recommended that all member states should invest in the promotion of research and development and use of ODR in their countries. And that's worth probably some study or follow-up to see exactly uh, what has happened in that regard. It did, and this is also quite interesting, contain a number of caveats and warnings, um, uh, usual ones about standards uh, of, of, of ODR. But one important one was that the concern would be if any system, because it was being used by one party to the dispute all the time, like an organization, a warehouse of disputes, or an insurance company where somebody's using it day in, day out, uh, and the other person is using it for the first and only time, the claimant, um, to watch out for systems that give an opportunity to the regular user to game the system that is being used. Um, and there's a lot more useful uh, recommendations and warnings of that nature. The second um, government court initiative I want to mention is UK based and that's the uh, formation of the online and launch of the online civil money claim pilot. Um, this is very exciting but I have to report concerns that I have from experience in using the system as to whether it's really going to achieve what it sets out to achieve. So this was set up I think, I think it opened for business on a public beta basis uh, two and a half to three years ago. It covers claims, uh, civil claims, of course, uh, up to £10,000 where money is the only issue. It followed recommendations from Lord Briggs uh, in a report on the structure of the civil courts more widely. And Lord Briggs, in turn, had picked up on recommendations in the report of the Civil Justice Council Advisory Group on ODR um, that um, was chaired by Richard Suskind, who meant you may have heard his talk earlier in the week, uh, and I'm pleased to say that I was invited into that group. And in our report, we set out why, what we thought uh, would amount to a court ODR system. We very much felt that the ODR should not be something outside of the courts and that we should extend and broaden what we mean by the courts to include what we consider to be online ADR systems. I have to say I'm very disappointed with the progress and I get this from, first of all, with the progress, it's still not a complete system. Um, and in two cases that I issued in the court myself, one was largely just to see how it operated. I sued Chelsea Football Club and that's a long story. Pleased to say that having invited me to the, uh, to Stamford Bridge, they, they settled a case in full. But there was an interesting thing happened part way through. 
Um, the solicitor sent me a defense to my claim. Um, and then about a couple of weeks later, when I went online to my case, I had a message saying, if you, if you click this button, uh, you'll be able to enter judgment by default uh, because the defense has not entered a defense. Now, I knew that not to be true because they'd sent it to me. We'd had a discussion about it. And I wasn't going to waste any time on this. Uh, it turned out in investigation, and went to the end of the day, that in fact, what happened was that the legacy system, the old system was still operating, of course, because the new one was not complete, that there's no communication between the two. Uh, and I felt that's a pretty obvious error to make. That's I assured is now being completed, but now they do check with the old system, because what the lawyers had done was send it in the old way to a dedicated email address that they were used to for sending notes. In the other case, more recent one, I have obtained judgment by default, whereupon the system tells me you have to go out of the system because this is as far as our journey goes with the online court. And I think that's sad that we, it really is still not complete. So maybe there's some lessons to be learned from that when, when setting up these online systems. The third one I mentioned, which also uh, failed to really achieve um, its objective, I feel, is the EU directive, European Union's directive on alternative dispute resolution for consumer disputes, together with its associated regulation on online dispute resolution for consumer disputes. I think I may be wrong, people tell me, correct me if I am, that this might be the first legislation that actually had online dispute resolution now on. in its title. Okay. There was a lot of reason to be optimistic. This legislation, which came into effect in February 2016, would encourage the use of ODR, not just by the use of the, of the acronym in the title, um, but for the reason the way it was set up. So what it required, two things from businesses throughout Europe who sell online to consumers. Firstly, that their websites must contain an easily accessible, those words are important, hyperlink to an European Commission designed and run ODR platform. Nicholas, I think, was just talking about that briefly. Uh, and secondly, that all consumers with whom businesses had the dispute and had not resolved the dispute, um, that they should in fact point them in the direction of an ADR service approved by their local regulator, in the UK it's Trading Standards Institute, and that complied with certain standards set out in the directive on ADR. And one of those standards was that the service must allow people to raise their cases and communicate online and therefore effectively they had to be ODR providers. Um, and uh, uh, however, there were problems with this. Well, that sounds great. You want to refer people to a platform that will refer them, or that will be on the website to give confidence to your, uh, for the public in buying from European traders. And you would have to point them to an approved uh, resolver. But the problem was that uh, no doubt from uh, some sort of consultations and lobbying by the industry, uh, it did not require the business to actually participate in the process of online dispute resolution. So they would have this ridiculous situation where uh, they would tell people we're obliged to refer you to such and such a company to resolve your dispute, but by the way, we're not gonna be involved in it, so it won't resolve your dispute. Uh, and therefore that went to the loss of trust in the whole system. Uh, there's also been very little enforcement of it. So the last report that I saw published by the EU uh, showed that only 28% of companies were complying with the law by having an easily accessible hyperlink on their site to the portal. Uh, that's 72% non-compliance. Uh, some year or two after it came into effect, I think from when that report was done, and I don't believe it's, it's significantly improved because they haven't, they haven't yet produced some further figures, uh, my inquiries tell me. But this shows a great lack of effort by member governments in creating awareness of this new law. And the reality is that of the 28% that actually did have the link they were required to have, they were not easily accessible because they were buried deep 
down within the terms and conditions. And as we know, and we all tell this lie every week or month or even day, I have read, understood and agreed to the terms and conditions. We just don't read terms and conditions. So that's very, very disappointing. And if any other governments are thinking of bringing in similar legislation, please make participation by business, not by the consumer, of course, but by the business uh, obligatory, and also ensure that you enforce it. My um, fourth and final example of some organization and governmental initiative in ODR in Europe you may feel, my colleagues here, a little bit cheeky to claim it as a European development, but it did start in Europe in 2002 with the support of a European multi-governmental body. And it has had a significant and continuing impact on the encouragement of interest and development in the field. And of course, referring to our international forum on online dispute resolution, Ethan, Ethan Cash and Day One Choi. It was in the of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe uh, together helped to create this forum, which its first two years, 2002 and 2003, was held at the Palais des Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, and of course now continues, and we're all eagerly awaiting, I'm sure, next year for the 20th forum in Dublin. Um, there's a lot more there, so obviously buy the book to have it, but uh, there's four initiatives that we can think about and perhaps discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much, Graham. That was great. And uh, uh, someone told me once, uh, you know you're famous when a crazy person imitates you. So I think we know that ODR has reached a certain level of renown now that we have been Zoom bombed. That was my first experience in that. Um, uh, Leah and I are watching the door. We're the big burly bouncers now. We're not letting anybody else in. So um, I think we'll be editing that video later. But um, let's uh, now turn to our good friends, Alberto and Maria, please. The floor is yours. Thanks. As Ali. usual, I was muted. And anyway, thank you, Graham. It was a very uh, interesting presentation, especially the slides. And um, I, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for, for us, for uh, Maria Victoria and for me, have the opportunity to have our 10 minutes of glory um, to share with you what uh, uh, we did in Latin America and a small um, idea what we wrote in our uh, chapter. Um, I will allow Maria Victoria to start our presentation, five minutes, and then I will talk five minutes with you, okay? We, you're okay, Maria Victoria? You could start? Yes, yes, I'm okay. Fine. Well, uh, with Alberto, uh, we studied a situation in uh, America, uh, Latin America and Argentina. Uh, we like to say that uh, in our region, uh, OGR is a space in construction. We are building OGR in Latin America and in Argentina uh, because uh, there are uh, different developments on practice and frameworks. Uh, we say that because uh, there are uh, many uh, differences uh, between the countries of the region and also within each country. Uh, we have to say that uh, Latin America is a, a big continent and uh, Alberto uh, will speak about the situation in Brazil, Mexico, uh, with uh, the learning situation, with the training situation, and uh, with uh, the projects uh, about frameworks. Uh, now, uh, we in Argentina, 
uh, has a federal, uh, Argentina has a federal system of government. Uh, so we don't have a national framework for OGR. Um, each provincial state has a different development and uh, we have uh, differences uh, between uh, each uh, provincial state. For example, Salta was the first a provincial state that uh, ha, had trained uh, about OGR by OGR Latin America with Alberto Elizabeth in 2012. Uh, then uh, another uh, provincial state uh, joined as Córdoba, Buenos Aires, and Mendoza. Uh, Buenos Aires uh, had uh, in 2020 uh, training for 1,500 uh, mediators uh, in, in, online uh, because of the pandemic. We have to say that the COVID-19 pandemic situation uh, was a, a great influence on uh, OGR for Latin America and for Argentina uh, because uh, we uh, could uh, allow uh, more access to justice to all the people when the, the war stopped. And uh, many countries in Latin America asked to OGR Latin America uh, for training, for training for mediators, and uh, we uh, could uh, leave a great experience uh, training a lot of a lot of uh, mediators, uh, three thousand uh, mediators uh, all over Latin America, including Ar Argentina. Alberto, uh, you uh, can continue. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, if you stop uh, sharing your uh, screen, please, Maria Victoria. Yes. Okay, well, just a few minutes. Uh, it's uh, interesting uh, for me. First, thank you all for being here. Um, uh, it's a pleasure for us because, for example, listen uh, Nicolas uh, from Canada, and I don't remember exactly the year, but we have been in Montreal uh, participating in a forum uh, with a tremendous um, room with the cyber justice experience, and this is a uh, it was for us a fantastic experience to visualize which was the future and where when people work from a university very serious in promote software for ODR. And I don't know if that was 2012, 2013. Nicolas, perhaps you, you could tell me what was the year, but uh, it was a long time ago. But um, and you're still pushing, but and it's difficult to understand from the mediator side that they had the possibility to stop thinking about move the 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 face-to-face -face mediation to a Zoom room and that's it. That's the, the, the problem that we face in general in Latin America and Spain. In Latin America, we have 650 million inhabitants. It's a huge uh um, amount of people in order to, and I'm sure we have 650 million of conflicts. Uh, and this is a huge market. In Brazil, for example, you have uh, 200 million inhabitants and you have 100 million people in uh, suits in the court. Average, 100% of the population in Brazil it's in court and an, a regular process took 
12th year in order to get the sentence. They are not going to mediation or to ODR because they believe in, they are going because there are no other feasibility. And the same is happening in Latin America in general, because when the politician says, you have to defend your rights, go to the court, they are not putting enough money in order to increase the amount of employees and technology to absorb the increase of demand from the citizens and from the public. Basically, we are in, in Latin America and Spain in a very interesting situation. We train and train and train mediators in ODR, just to mediate online through a video conference uh, platform. We don't like it. We are watching in other processes coming from India, coming from Europe, uh, text mediation, okay, blended mediation, uh, consumer platform, and um, really uh, now we are facing a very interesting situation. Some platform from Asia and Europe are trying to get into Latin America with the difficult that the, nobody wants to spend money in translation for the uh, software tools, okay? Which is funny because a lot of people in the a lot of money in developed platform, but they don't want to put it in uh, Spanish or uh, Portuguese. And but it will be a situation that we ha they have to cope with. We are uh, developing in the center of a country a platform. I'm not allowed yet to uh, give uh, you the name, which will be a full Zoom. The idea is starting from the beginning of the files, ending in a blockchain signature. Probably it will be ready um, around the end of December. And this is a platform to cope with the amount of a lot, of, um, a huge amount of. Uh, mediation provided directly from the government of social uh, public service, okay? The mediation from five, seven governments in Argentina is free. It's community mediation. The citizen could go to the government and request a mediation through a platform, through a cell phone. And this is the first step. The second step will be have the possibility to have the, the software inside the court. Because the problem with the uh, services which are uh, in uh, servers, which do not belong to the court, has a huge hole regarding the protection of the citizen data. And no, there are no chief technological officer in any court saying, I'm very happy, let's go to a server which is not in our network in order to run a mediation. And this is a stop all the process. And there are no possibility for private uh, developers to get the possibility to develop their business if they are not in have the software installed inside the code. Uh, well, we are dealing with this. I understand that we are uh, short of time. All we are in, in our region, it's an explosion. Uh, everybody knows now what's the meaning of all the others I told the other day, uh, Ethan. And we are very, very happy with our contribution in a, in a region where we have around 50% of poverty and where we have to close the, close the digital gap. I'm some uh, the bossy guy calling on the screen. I'm finishing my presentation. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, Alberto. You very thank you, Maria. For all of you, thank you, Maria, for help to uh, contribute with me in the presentation. Excellent, excellent. So let me just do my presentation quickly here because I'd like to uh, use the balance of our time as much as possible for questions. Um, is everybody seeing my screen, Peace Tech and ODR? Any nods? Okay, good. So uh, I, I have long wanted to forge more of a connection between the peace tech field and the online dispute resolution field. So I appreciated the opportunity 
to write a chapter on that for the book. Uh, there are a lot of similarities between ODR and peace tech that I call out in my chapter. Um, you know, both peace building and dis dispute resolution existed for decades, and now technology is coming in and creating new opportunities. Obviously, we are focused on resolving disputes in the ODR field. Peace tech is focused on that as well, but uh, they're, they're focused mainly on managing conflict so that it doesn't escalate into violence. And, you know, we're dealing with more transactional individual type disputes. But both of these fields are enabled by technological innovation. And some of the things that are opening doors for us in the ODR field are also opening doors in peace tech. Um, and they're, they're, these are legacy practice areas where you have very large institutions that have been doing them for a long time. And then online tool, on, you know, society is moving online and this legacy practice has to adapt. So there's a lot of parallels in terms of the struggles that the peace tech field is having convincing the legacy entities to adopt some of its techniques. But also tech brings exciting new capabilities and opportunities that I'm going to speak about in a minute, just like technology brings exciting new capabilities and opportunities to dispute resolution. But there is also a similar potential for abuse. People can use these tools in ways to exacerbate conflict both um, in, in terms of uh, bad behavior that we address on the ODR field, but also um, obviously we see this on an international basis. And both fields are trying to overcome resistance to the approaches that they are promulgating, not only the approaches we have today in ODR, but also all the stuff coming down the pike with blockchain and smart contracts and machine learning and you know everything, who knows what's gonna be invented? Well, Peace Tech is doing the same thing. So uh, you know the main areas I think they're, there's a very interesting aspect of peace tech, which is focused on data, which is gathering all of the data that is coming in from all of these signal sources and synthesizing it and trying to track what, what regions, what areas, what countries are at risk of tipping over into violence. And there's been a lot of work that's been happening. So I'm on the board of the Peace Tech Lab at the United States Institute of Peace. They've done a lot of work on uh, the COVID-19, tracking violence that's associated with that. But there was another project um, that, that uh, the Peace Tech Lab promoted, uh, which was looking at data, uh, Twitter, text messages, blog posts, Facebook posts, synthesizing all of it in real time, and trying to see if we can use that data to predict when violence is likely to break out, um, which I think is very interesting. And I, as we look, again, there are some techniques in Peace Tech that we might want to absorb into the ODR field. I think this focus on data and having, uh, you know, these large amounts of data coming in, synthesizing the data and trying to gather intel from it, that's an interesting possibility for us. Another is hate speech. Um, and there's a lot of work in trying to get lexicons of hateful terms and hateful words um, in a lot of minority languages that are not often tracked by large social media and internet intermediary, com inter internet intermediary companies. So this is something where if you track these terms and you can make them publicly available, then those companies can absorb them because they don't have customer service staff that can code in these local languages. Um, another area that's very interesting is creating local exchanges in conflict regions around the world. I think, you know, Alberto with ODR Latino America has done a fantastic job in Latin America. Uh, Mornique is doing a great job with ODR Africa. This is something we might want to think about in the ODR space too, is do we want to have more boots on the ground in certain regions? You know, it's great to see all these projects come and go. I love to, uh, seeing the historical tracker of everything that's gone on in Canada that Nicola shared. But, um, you know, it, it is interesting to think if there's a region where we don't see a lot of ODR, that may be an opportunity for us to identify someone and empower them, give them some tools, give them some data that they can use to get some traction. The other thing that's very interesting in the peace tech space is an openness towards media. And we often say that ODR is the use of information and communications technology to help people prevent, manage, and resolve their disputes. But we don't really do much with media, which obviously is a communications technology and which is extremely influential. And I think there's some very exciting things happening with radio and TV, um, you know, dramas and movies. So I just think this is something that, that we should think about. Um, I'm not quite sure how it would be relevant in the ODR context, aside from building demand for our services, but it's incredible to see how powerful some of these relatively modest investments in media can be in terms of achieving the ends of peace tech. So the point that I just wanna make, and I wanna put this on all of your radar, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very much here in the US, but peace tech is very much a global movement, just like ODR is a global movement. I think really ODR is peace tech. 
Um, I'm not sure if all piece tech is ODR, but we are definitely cousins at least. And there is an emerging industry around peace tech. I think governments want to invest in peace tech. They understand that there are actors who are using technology to exacerbate conflict and promote violence. And to counter that, we need to build a peace tech movement that's using these tools in creative ways to address some of those issues. And I do think over the long run, you know, uh, technology provides a lot of opportunities to build peace and understanding and, and head off conflict before it gets violent. Uh, we have a lot of learning to do between here and there. I think we're further along in ODR than they are in the peace tech space. But I would just encourage all of you in the ODR space to reach out to local peace tech organizations within your geography and establish some of these connections because I think we are kindred movements and we can learn from each other. And, and, and I think they would be interested just as we're interested in some of the work that's happening in their field. I think uh, they would be interested in the work we're doing as well. So I will leave it there. Um, okay. We now have, I think, how much do we have time? We have 15 minutes left. So let's uh, open it up. Um, this is, anyone is fair game, any presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions or comments, why don't I start first with the presenters? Do you have any comments or questions for your other fellow presenters? Anything that, that jarred uh, your interest and you want to make a comment on? We'll start there. But if anyone has any comments, please. Nicholas, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, uh, bounce back on what Graham mentioned, that uh, they were having trouble uh, forcing uh, companies to take part in uh, consumer dispute uh, resolutions. Uh, yeah. What we found here in Quebec when we launched a project with the um, Consumer Protection Agency, um, we had the same issue of how are you going to get the merchants to just take part in the ODM pro ODR process. And that was one of the downfalls of Equidzeo when we launched the project back in 2001. And what we did is we said, well, we can't really use the stick, uh, but we can use the carrot because we just, they just, the Consumer Protection Agency did not have the, the power to force the merchants to take part, but they could give them a, a, an incentive. And the incentive they use is that every year in Quebec, the uh, Consumer Protection Agency publishes a blacklist of all of the worst offen offenders, right? Mm -hmm. All of this, the companies that are rated as horrible uh, as far as uh, consumer uh, prote protection is concerned. And mm -hmm. those are the, the companies that we first approached. And we said, look, if you are willing to be bound by uh, the ODR process, we will take you off that list, or rather every case that is settled will be taken off of your final tally. And so that might have the, uh, uh, the impact of getting you, either putting you lower on that list or taking you off that list completely. And that actually worked surprisingly well, enough that these companies uh, now all took part and their competitors were the ones calling us to say, it's, it's uh, an, an unfair competition advantage for them to be allowed to use your platform and not us. So the merchants were actually the ones that were now asking us to be bound. So I don't know if there's something in there that can be useful for you, but it is, it's the approach that we yeah. used here and it actually showed some promise. Thank you, Nicholas, for that. And actually, just before I answer that, uh, just a bit of clarification why I might have gone a bit blank at uh, Alberto's comment and uh, Collins. When I was speaking, I was just, sh I was not looking at the screen. I was looking at my, I'd actually printed out what I was going to say and was looking at that. So whilst I heard there was a Zoom bower, uh, I've now found out that there was a bit of a display at the same time. So uh, <laughs> that's just why I was blanked. Um, now, that's interesting, Nicholas, thanks for saying that, because in fact, I was looking at, there is an issue that they're looking at in the UK of um, an unacceptable late payment situation where larger companies are taking far too long to play small to medium sized enterprise and the government's looking at systems to encourage that. And one of the things that I did address is the potential for having some sort of um, uh, I don't know, some sort of uh, scoring system uh, of the speed with which you do pay a, um, a supplier. Obviously, this is not necessary. This is excluding disputes, but um, which the idea being that suppliers had had a good score for, uh, sorry, 
customers had a good score for paying quickly uh, might uh, be might find uh, more people offering better terms to them etc so either way the carrot needs to be looked at in its different format so so thank you for that nicholas but i'd love to know what that how that developed in practice and whether it's made um any impact on the degree to which firms do participate yeah, I have a question for Nicholas. Um, I, I thought it was very interesting to look at the development of uh, Canada in terms of the private companies that cropped up like Nova Forum and Equibly, and then they died. I love the grave with the vulture on it. It's a little a uh, little dark, but I, I get your point. Um, it was but Halloween it, when I prepared it. <laughs> there you go. That's fine. That's fine. Um, but the, the thing that I think is interesting is I've had a long running discussion with Pablo about should ODR live in the private sector or the public sector? And Pablo says public, and I say private. Um, but it's interesting to me in Canada, it seems like the ideas of ODR started out, obviously, there was e-resolution, and you know, we've had these providers, and they've come and gone, and they haven't been able to find traction. But now we're seeing the public entities move in. And I, I feel like um, the whole world is looking at the civil resolution tribunal to figure out how should we do this. It, is this some kind of a passing of the torch, maybe, where, and I, I see this in the United States, too, the courts are adopting ODR left and right. There's probably more code court ODR programs now than there are private ODR service providers, um, maybe by a factor of, you know, five. So that's just an interesting dynamic. And I was wondering if, if you, what do you, what do you observe in Canada? Well, I, I, I would take Pablo's position or rather say, unless you're associated with it, private ODR doesn't work. Um, because <laughs> oh, everybody me, uses... I've buried companies. You can put me <laughs> under the vulture too. Yeah. But I mean, we all use eBay as the, the example, right? But that's really the only uh, example of a, a really strong private ODR provider over the years. Um, uh, definitely in Canada, that, that, that is the way uh, uh, things fell. And I think basically, because courts and tribunals are also realizing what the reason why ODR in the first place uh, emerged or why ADR emerged in general, and that is that the courts are just just not uh, uh, supplying the, the services that the population uh, is expecting. Uh, there are the, the court dockets are overbooked and there's uh, there's delays. Uh, I, I, I'm sure Alberto could speak of it, but I've, I've spoken with colleagues from uh, uh, Brazil uh, who said that there are millions of cases in the backlog uh, that cannot be settled. So ODR is just one tool uh, among many that the courts can use in order to uh, uh, make those dockets a little lighter and, and to increase uh, uh, access to justice through the, 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 the normal uh, processes. And, but by adding uh, uh, the mediation and the negotiation elements to it, you're also making sure that a lot of cases that are currently making it to the courts that don't really require a, a judge's interpretation or, or legal knowledge, that, that those are, are settled through means that are, are more appropriate to them. And I saw that uh, Amy raised her hand, so I'll let her complete. Yeah, I just wanted to add one other piece. Um, I really appreciate all the comments and I really thank you everyone. Really interesting stuff. I would add, Colin, in thinking about your question, especially because I have kind of done a deep dive and looking at the expansion into um, online dispute resolution in the courts. Um, and I do think part of it is enforcement, right? I mean, I think part of the problem that happens with a lot of private providers is they end up struggling to get clients and they struggle to get into people's contracts and they struggle for enforcement. And I think um, eBay had kind of a special way of enforcing because of PayPal. Um, whereas I think other private ODR providers struggle when they can't figure out the enforcement piece. Whereas if it's part of the court, right? So if it's a CRT or whatever it might be, um, they automatically have the enforcement piece and I think that that is probably why we've seen such a huge expansion into the public domain and specifically the courts and other administrative tribunals. Well, I, I agree enforcement is the key determinant of success in ODR. But for me, again, going back to Jan, that's a DSD challenge. I mean, at Modria, we built systems for insurance. We built systems for e-commerce. We built systems for property tax appeals. We partnered with the organizations that had the enforcement power. And they, all those programs are still running. 
you know, people always say to me, why don't you build a system for Craigslist? <laughs> no, they don't have any enforcement power. It would be a waste of time. I could go build it, but you know, then I would render decisions that wouldn't be useful. So I don't think that that's a reason why I actually think that court enforcement is incredibly cost prohibitive and complicated. I'm not sure if that's the solution. I like decentralized justice. Like let's all move to a software framework where we have the same enforcement ability we had at PayPal. You know, like maybe that's where that's going to end up in 10 years. We're all going to be purchasing within a software framework that provides that instant enforcement. But I think we need to be looking for caseloads where enforcement exists. I mean, Tim, you're doing these, these claims in the UK. You don't have any enforcement problems with those resolutions, right? I mean, th does that happen automatically? Is it built into your systems design? Yeah, the, the, um, the claims portal that uh, I, I work with, there are traffic claims, um, but that is... Uh, uh, agreements are reached and, and the insurers pay. I mean, it's, it's, uh, so there's mm -hmm. never a, a, an enforcement issue on, on those. Um, the same with the uh, the medical malpractice claims we, we have. Um, you, you've got a, a large state organization who is, who is the defendant, so they're, they're paying. So I think it's, uh, you look at the, the organizations you're dealing with, um, but uh, it's not a problem in, in the sectors I work in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? I know we're, we're getting down to it. I think we only have four more minutes. Um, Colin, one occurs to me, one Bill, you'll be area next. where the enforcement can come up is in um, disputes over services where, and a lot of these sites uh, provide a sort of limited escrow service. The money is kept by them or so should really be by a third party. So that enforcement becomes less of a problem. They just want, they provide a, effectively a, a determination of whether the money should go to the customer or the, or the, or back to the client. Um, so clearly that that's one way around the enforcement problem where there is money in escrow awaiting a decision, uh, whether by agreement or determination, but obviously that's not covering everything, but that's a huge amount of potential there for private ODR providers, I would have thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bill, what did you want to say? I was thinking about um, kind of different classes of types of conflicts and wondering about, um, like in the United States, we have a lot of concerns about police brutality uh, or mistreatment of immigrants. Uh, and are there ODR platforms developing where making claims uh, related to mistreatment, uh, you know, is that, ignored in our in our current world it, it it could be peace tech is where that work gets done but i'm just wondering um you know are activists interested in odr and if so how do they use it well i i don't want to dominate the floor but this is definitely something that we are looking at applying odr.com against i'm talking with um police officer police um departments who have um citizen complaint portals where citizens have the legal right to complain about an interaction with the police. Sometimes they have the ability to do that anonymously. Um, you know, we're working with uh, some people who do diversity and equity work in universities and they want a platform where they can receive anonymous, you know, uh, reports of issues that people might otherwise not report because they don't want to be on the hook as, you know, being identified as the, as the person who made the report. So, I definitely think this is an area that we can move into. I don't think it's a dispute in the purest sense, but I think it's a it's an issue that needs to be reported and followed up on. Um, you know, some of the ombuds work that we're doing again crosses that line. Is it a dispute or is it, you know, a, an issue that needs to be reported and investigated and potentially anonymously? So I think I, I hope that's something that we can focus on moving forward. I don't know if anybody else has an opinion about that. Okay, well, we have time for one final comment or question. No. Maybe Aldo has something you'd like to say. Oh, no, please, Janet, yes. Yes, no, I wanted to ask on this question of the, um, the momentum around uh, the technology, AI, what other countries are pushing in that direction where you're using the AI machine learning as part of the fourth party tool uh, in practice. Any uh, Canada, Nick, uh, Graham? 
Anyone? Not as a, a general principle in Canada, at least. Uh, uh, there are some, we're actually looking into it. And in fact, uh, uh, Amy and I are, are working together on that mm -hmm. and looking how uh, AI can and should be incorporated into ODR platforms. But as far as I know, and my, my colleague Jean-Francois Roberge had done a survey uh, about three years ago and noticed that really there's, there's nothing on the market right now that is truly a fourth party uh, uh, or a, par a platform where the third and fourth mm -hmm. party were melded. The only example I have is the kids court on Amazon Alexa, uh, <laughs> which is technically a, a, a completely uh, a, a AI operated uh, ODR platform. But since it's to settle disputes between children over who ate the last cookie, I don't know that it's necessarily that <laughs> useful for our research. <laughs> I would say, though, I think um, China has a proposal and they are definitely working in that direction in different ways to um, promote the harmonization of judicial decision making and then also for sort of support decision support tools that are automated um, using AI. And so I do think we're seeing some movement in that direction. I started a chart on um, courts in the US um, and they're using it in different ways. Um, not wholesale making decisions, um, but most definitely in different ways, a lot of different ways. Yeah. I mean, in I think UK, a, yeah, there is nothing in the sense of, I mean, there's no opportun opportunity being taken in relation to gathering data, big data, whatever you call it, with a view to developing some AI solutions. But there is uh, money that's been put, set aside by government to uh investigate um that sort of area not just they but odr and just where there is a an, a result of resolving disputes the organization called law tech uk has been set up and been funded the, the feasibility report has been issued recently um but it's still early days but it's um I think it, it, it's all down to what we mean by AI, of course. Are we, are we yeah. just talking about the data in the case? Or are we talking about learning from yeah. big data, using that phrase loosely? I know. Yeah. That, yeah. I mean, yeah. Graham said to me once, this is years ago, more than a decade ago, if I had a dime for every conversation people are having about ODR, I could retire today. But the actual number of programs is it a pittance. Might, it might and, have been uh, a pound, I said. I maybe a pound. No, maybe a pound. Maybe a, a tuppence. I don't know. Some strange UK currency. But uh, so that's the way I feel about AI. It's like, man, we come to talk about AI. Will you do a presentation on AI? Okay, fine. What is actually happening? I mean, I see Samuel DeHaan's program. I see Margaret Hagen's program. Every time I actually see somebody use AI to do something in our world, I am resoundingly underwhelmed. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how many conferences are we going to have talking about how AI is going to replace all the arbitrators and we can't even sort cases into the appropriate redress channel, you know, with natural language processing. I, st I still think we are a decade away from any of that stuff happening, but who knows, maybe there's going to be breakthrough. Well, for AI many people, yeah, and for many people now, now, of course, ODR simply means Zoom. Uh, and, right. um, and, and, and this is a problem. Mediation has long had that problem. Uh, uh, there's a new program called uh, Mediate the Mediator with Ice T, the rapper. I don't know if anyone has ever yeah, seen. Yeah, I have seen that. Yeah, <laughs> and um, that's not going to give people a good, accurate view of what mediation is. I'm afraid. Well, it's an accurate view uh, of if Ice T was mind. your mediator. So, yeah. So, anyway, um, I think that's our time. Thank you so much, everyone. It's wonderful to see your faces. Uh, my only regret is that I'm going to click um, end and then I won't see them in a few moments. But it was lovely to share this time with you. And this has been a wonderful week. And um, here's to, um, here's to well. Dublin. Here's to Dublin. Dublin. First round of Guinness is on Graham. <laughs>